Good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Ingram. I'm here to talk about building information modeling. Um, I am addressing the CTEC group, the group of CEOs, engineers, and entrepreneurs across the world. And I'm truly honored as there are people amongst this group who I've known only by reputation. So thank you for coming. Anyway, so tonight I'm going to talk about my story as an entrepreneur and the story of BIM. BIM being something you all know about already. Um, I have a sort of a long checkered career in many different things, but tonight we'll just take out the BIM bits and maybe flash onto one or two others. I was born on a little island in the middle of the Pacific, sort of halfway between Indonesia and Panama. And you can see from the scale of an aircraft carrier there, it's quite a small island. So that was somewhere near the end of the Earth. I then, my parents then moved to the end of the Earth, which was in the gold fields, what was the gold fields, in Australia, which was definitely one horse town. This is the view of my town in my childhood. If you can see what I mean. I went to school, but not really, until I was, didn't really go to school until I was 13. But as a boy, my father had opened in a local, an account opened in a local hardware store um, where I conducted my own education. How I didn't die, die I don't know. But I have, uh, you can see ingredients for all sorts of interesting things there, including nitroglycerine and hydrogen balloons and uh, gunpowder. I made boats, I made engines, basically whatever I could felt like rocket ships were my favorite. Um, made out of empty CO2 cylinders with some sort of propellant, home manufactured propellant in them, built into some sort of Meccano. But I took engines apart and I think this bode me fairly well for later on in life. I did very badly when I went to secondary school, uh, but eventually I got to uh, study engineering and built, when I graduated, I worked as a Shire engineer well, as assistant shower engineer, to be more exact, and built this magnificent piece of work here, a um, floodway and several miles of roads, country roads. This is actually the country road, but it doesn't have quite enough wiggles in it to be mine. I also did some pipe networks uh, within the local shire, involved slide rules and log tables. Um, a, there was a brief web-reinforced I-beams job, but quite quickly I moved into the CSRO. The CSRO is a Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization where I was uh, an experimental officer, class one, which is a type of scientist. And I would do research, provide tools for scientists around about. And these are, here we had some real toys. We had the biggest computer in the world, which was then a Cyber 76, CDC Cyber 76 various PDP-11s, and a Comp-80, along with all sorts of interesting peripherals. This is the day of the Tektronic tube, green tube. There were no color screens, none, not one. You can see these guys, I think they held sort of two megabytes or something. There, I did some interesting things. So now you can see the sort of things which begin to make up part of BIM later on and why I actually went the way I went. So here we have the a reverse polish stack, which is an expression analyzer and executor. You can sort of semi-compile and store the expressions, which I had to do for one of the packages I wrote at the CSRO. We dealt with fonts, and uh, this proved very useful later on. A comp lady had stroking fonts, and um, this is my attempt at building them from splines at that time. Uh, this was, I did some color images. So I wrote a color imaging algorithm from first principles and with the clipping and bits and pieces. This is, there was still no color screen. So I had to do a um, color separation. It was printed as color separation. Contour maps, this is my first shot from a tectronics tube. And of course, final element meshes. So that's pretty much what I, well, I did something else too. And here we have, what I think is the first architectural hidden line movie of a real street scene. 
streets in Hobart, Tasmania. I understand this is 1977 when it was such amount of data that we couldn't even get it to run on the computer. But on the it ran on the biggest computer as a hidden line movie. So it was too much data to bring across to the um, Comp 80 via would have been hundreds of magnetic tapes worth of um, data to get the image, make the image. The data was transferred by tape between the Comp 80 and the Cray, uh, Cyber 76. Sorry. So this is the hidden line movie. So again, I did a lot of experimenting. It was run from cards. So the model was input in cards. I did the algorithm in cards and the flight path was in cards. So you can see the sort of idea. Um, I left the CSO in Australia and went to work for GMW Partnership, a very forward thinking partnership in London, an architectural partnership. I went overland through all the countries. I mean, there, I'd, I'd heard about BDS from John Giro at the ground on the grounds of Sydney University when I jumped in on a few architectural um, lectures from him. He, he's actually published a book, which some of the illustrations later in my book you'll see. Um, BDS, which is the beginnings of BIM, did the following. They had two and a half D representations, these five different representations of components, which were assembled together to make a building model. There, um, this Sonata, uh, Rucap, sorry, was a direct derivation of that. And I went to work on Rucaps at GMW. They sold Rucaps uh, for Riyadh University computer aid production system. So Riyadh University was designed using this. It was very good at hospitals. And here we have a description of the system at the time. I added 3D and there were the first color screens just beginning to appear. There were uh, 1000 by 800 resolution and uh, 20, well, 8 bit color usually. So uh, you would have a color lookup table to get the reasonable number of colors, but you'd only have 256 different colors on the screen. You know, I used, you can see here, RUCAPS, and I, I say this for a reason. RUCAPS was a 2.5D drafting system, and this Reynolds at the time wrote that about. Root caps. So to suggest, yeah. working there with the architects and working on root caps, I learned many things uh, that different people see the building as different things, and coordination was a huge issue. I mean, principally those two things. But I sat and thought about it for a while, and I decided, well, I did offer it to that company at the time, GMW, but they declined. So I jumped into the abyss of being an entrepreneur. I went to the bank and said, can you loan me um, quite a lot of money against my house? And they said, sure. So I left the company and <coughs> they had bought myself a screen, a very expensive 30,000 pounds worth of screen at the time, effectively 30,000 pounds now. And they went back to Barclays and said, okay, could I borrow some more money, please? Or could I borrow some money, please? And they said, no, sorry, you don't have a job. Go away. And that was almost the end of it. But I battled on and I made several solitary years. And by solitary, I mean just me in my attic. And the local company that I'd left was uh, not talking and had forbidden everyone to talk to me. I mean, they were really pretty unpleasant about it. And I sat and wrote Sonata. And at the time I wrote several documents which are now defined, now found in the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, in the RABA archive. This one I wrote in 85 after I actually wrote the code. And you see we have object-based coordination. Object, I call this early system building object models. And of course in 2003 they became building information models. An object model is uh, exactly the same as an information model, you'll see. There is no difference. Um, single objects in the model, symbol, uh, which have different 
sorts of information associated with them so we can get uh, correctly revised drawings and intelligent models who have full parametric models right from the get-go self-designing self-detailing and we had some network and connectivity calculations uh, which we'll see later on they included windows cutting holes in walls and wall details between with closure information between walls and windows and walls and walls and other things um, the only e the only difference between this and revit at this time revit yes is that I manually, and you'll see it working in a minute, selected and worked the uh, the overlap or the holes, the interactions between the windows and the walls. And uh, Revit does it by families. Much more control this way. And no one ever objected. Um, had integrated non-graphics and lots of report generators and things which are, you'll see as we go on that's me in 1985 i think and that's my whitechapel computer works which was the first laptop or first desktop computer of the time to appear in england it had a monochrome screen and a uh, fairly low resolution and a portrait compiler there were no libraries of any sort. No graphics libraries, nothing. There are no pull-down menus. Pull-down menus had hardly been invented. In 1984 you had your first Max appearing and I had already seen it some years before in rank Xerox, the pull-down menu and icon idea and I'd already resolved to do this. And I do think that Sonata was perhaps the first of the more substantial CAD programs to, certainly the BIM programs, to use pull-down menus and icons. And again you'll see this as we go on. But it was a major undertaking, and here I am looking wearier with having spent all those years on punch cards where the girls did the typing with me moving on to here. And this is the functionality which I had to implement myself. Some of it had come from the earlier years, some of it had come from my PhD, uh, which I'd done while at GMW. The PhD was in image generation. So I wrote various image generation algorithms uh, for 3D and clipping and that sort of thing and worked out well. Anyway, so you can see the range of stuff here. Remember there's no graphics. So one of the most exciting bits of code I thought I'd written was there's no window handling. So to have a, a multi-window system I had to write the window handling myself, which I did in a few lines of code. And this is my more impressed with this than anything else I've ever written. So three lines of code that handles recursively called the handle and draw window in the right shape, in the right order, overlapping correctly. Um, and that's by bulleting the memory into the, uh, onto the screen. Similarly, we, I had to write how to, just drawing a single line, I had to do from first principles. So it was quite a lot of background work just to start drawing lines on, I did the icon, so for instance, to save the icons, I had to do pull down. I had to write the icon saving software. I had to generate, um, have an icon drawing program, <laughs> and I had to have some way of reading it all back. I mean, not just the icons. Obviously, the hidden lines, hidden surface stuff was from the PhD. Uh, reverse polish was for the parametric interpreter. I had to write parametric shapes for all the 2D and 3D shapes. It was a 2D, 3D, so 3D in that there are mixtures of graphics. Obviously, if you're looking at it in elevation, then you would see the 3D side, the 2D side with 3D mixed. And if you're looking at 3D, you see 3D. It needed Boolean operations and network structures. I mean, wall details, wall handling, clash detection, everything was in there in the first system. And I thought about it all, and it's all documented in these documents, the um, which I actually found mostly in the back of my book, which we'll talk about later. In 1984, 5, 6, 86, I guess, I bought an Apollo computer, and I was very kindly given the Benson plotter. Who, they could see the benefits of what I was doing. So I then sat and converted, threw away some of the code, the Windows handling code, the um, and 
geared up for the graphics it was and I also employed an architectural draftsman Murray Pearson to come and help me do the testing he, I would work until six in the evening and he would work from six until three in my attic 3 a.m and this went on for many months while he sorted it Murray was very good he would say you know how can you how can an architectural draftsman do this it's just impossible you need to make it so that uh, this works these, these cavity closures work and that they are matched to the door they are matched to the window and that you, you know I don't mind how you do it you just have to do it so I did that and we ended up with quite a nice system here it is a screenshot of Sonata on the Apollo 1987 Four, five, six, eighty-six. You can see the hatching in the section on the floor slab. Uh, proper symbolic plans with uh, closure details correct there, where the windows been sorted into the walls. Um, you get cavity walls working correctly too. I went to quite a lot of trouble for that. And you have a mixture of two D and three D in the section here. So you can see the plants are 3D. The doors, and here's the door here, is in a 2D symbolic view of the door, which is correct as you would expect. And here you have our 3D chairs. The chairs are at odd rotation, so there's a whole lot of technology around or a whole lot of algorithms around working out what view you're going to draw. And strangely enough, um, Revit has the same ones. So I just watch a little bit of video of the time. This is very poor quality, but it's all that's left of the time. I think this video is 1987, 88. I am going to skip, skip through bits of this as it becomes apparent. Sonata operates in partial or full wireframe plus full shaded color. Sonata takes the drudgery out of design, releasing creativity. The latest generation of workstations is used with unique software developed by building design professionals. For ease of use, the keyboard is rarely used. This is 1988. Most and instructions about are conveyed by a mouse. The mouse. So in 85 when I did it was very new. By using a series of icons and pull-down menus, all instructions are conveyed with great ease and simplicity. Let's look at some of these in more detail. This is the 2D menu. They have lines, construction the lines, icons drawing represent lines, arcs, arcs up, and rubber shapes. banding lines, shapes, all of which from And this is the 3D menu, menu containing like spheres, boxes, and a variety there. of other objects. The roof, which hasn't changed very much, even in Revit, there, I don't think. Here we see the assemble menu, with the cursor moving to select well, assemble elements for assembling on the, the building active model. Similarly, the construct menu allows us to generate and place construction lines on the screen. And the snap menu gives the ability to position points on a layer with absolute precision. An aid memoir allows us to store individual... And then we just use Some time later, the sketch is by exchanging the lines in the sketch for fully detailed walls. Sonata's time-saving capabilities mean that sketch schemes can be turned into production drawings very rapidly. Sonata will go around automatically tidying up all the junctions regardless so of angle. Closure detail We're and now ready to introduce wall joint some detail all tidy in the top left hand corner of the building. As far as walls go and hatching. In selecting from our library, we search for the particular element in which we're interested. We may have used a variety of door types or objects in the last month, and here they're all stored, ready for instant recall. Data lists this information, page... You insert the place of windows in the wall, usual sort of thing. Using snap now. codes, the, the windows can be placed Sonata very accurately Revan in the wall at the required distance is apart. The connection between the wall and the window happens uh, at this the is a different kind of menu called yes. user default, using snap codes to find the nearest so part of the So we have parametric door. doors, so you change the parameters. At least you use the defined door, parametric doors. Meaning that its form can be varied in size and shape to meet the design criteria. 
In this case, we move from a single to a double door, and we're also introducing a scheduling reference. Let's now introduce a different style of window from our pop-up menu, the wall. Initially, these will be located transparently in the wall before confirming the join. So you Sonata can tell join the us by the creating doors, an intelligent joined. dynamic link between you'll them. See the tidy, tidy Here, up. windows and doors are being introduced very accurately together with appropriate detail. And there you have your The designer has indicated detail. that specific information will be used when particular doors or windows are related. Maybe on the next one. I'm just going to skip through this one. The way we set up perspective views. You see the use of icons sending the view. Remember, I used to calculate the, I had to count the floating point calculations just to ensure that a number of types of perspective data, can be used. In this case, a two point perspective. And we can even say to Sonata, let's limit our attention to this section of the building. This enables us to work as quickly in 3D as most systems can operate in 2D, basically changing all related. automatically placed at the correct height to selecting the appropriate colors changing the color we have full in control over the red model. green and blue components here's another example this is something I want to see at the end modeling study of the same square from a different view of background elements to give depth we missed the, somehow or other, I managed to miss the uh, uh, multi-user access, everyone sharing the single model, but it's in, it is in there somewhere. Uh, this is one of the icons, one of the pull-down menus, icon menus, and that's the actual screenshot at the time. Again, you can see my, I can't put my little signature in there everywhere, 23rd of June is my birthday, and you could select the different, um, shading capabilities for that menu. And now we're going to whip through these very quickly, examples from Sonata from 2000, from up until 2015. So these is 1987 with a yes, a stamp, uh, an Australian stamp with this on it. This is done by uh, Pedalthorpe in Australia. And just let me whip through it. Otherwise we're going to run out of time. This is the full set of coordinated drawings. It sort of um, plans elevations and 3D, in line 3D in this case, the actual buildings. Um, this, uh, Barclays managed to make it back into my life in spite of my best efforts not to allow them. But this, the top one is the real and the bottom one is not, in case you can't tell, but it, obviously it's not such, it's not realism to the, the way we know it today, but of the time it was pretty good. And that algorithm is you know, my own hidden surface algorithm. I did my PhD, computer science PhD in uh, computer generated images. Hidden line, automatic elevation uh, of police station, the Metropolitan Police, police station, Bethnal Green, with the shadows added automatically. And we get into engineering. Um, I, I, I sort of cheated with the engineering in that I allowed the users to write their own tools within the, as parametrics within the, this is an interpretive, within the objects, this is an interpretive language so that uh, it's not cross compiled into DLLs as it was in Reflex and is in Revit. Um, but these are, they, we got some pretty good stuff. They need a bit of help occasionally, but that's done by architects, the roof of the zoo and the, um, Frank Shaw, the other one. Uh, this left-hand image is, is reflex. The Albert Hall is radar, ground-based radar of the Albert Hall, automatically in installed. Different buildings as uh, modular building design, Taylor Woodrow. We have parametric stadium. The whole stadium is parametric, so you change parameters and different design things happen. And we have the core of the stadium of the um, building where it changes the number of loos and stairs and things depending on how long the arms are and what's required. So that's a parametric core of building. Um, this was used, this is a mixture of images actually. The 
bits of it are sonata and bits of a reflex. But basically, when Heathrow Express was made, the uh, tunnel, the system collapsed. They had to put in a coffer dam and put in steel piles. Mont MacDonald would had to do that work. And this is uh, views of the model from that. Basically, they put in sensors into the coffer dam, which fed back into the model to monitor the stuff moving. Again, with a bit of flexibility in the parametric objects, you can actually have it read external data from external places. And that's what these objects did and were to warn. Um, th the flag is here to remind me that my biggest customer was uh, Red China and they used, they bought hundreds of licenses and used it for um, city modeling and for uh, power plant design and transmission design. I've not, not been able to get any images, funny as that, but that was, they were, were my biggest customer. Um, 5D project modeling was done mostly was by Taylor Woodrow and that's a cover of a brochure from 95. That's Reflex. Um, we won the award for um, yeah that project whose name just escapes me. Uh, Taylor, Wood Taylor Woodrow used a connection between um, the model and the Gantt charts. A live connection, so as some by moving the bar along the bar chart, you could actually have the different part of the Gantt chart appear. And then we did engineering services because my background in piping and things as a Shire engineer, I was very interested in this. We did the uh, SVM, did the BAM UK, was then SVM, did the British Library, which I think is the biggest services project in Sonata. So these drawings are all Sonata. Um, let me just get do this one first. So that's an order of the complexity of sort of things we're doing with Sonata. So that's actually a plan working drawing, but if you look carefully, there is obscuration and, and we went to quite a lot of trouble to make it so that the mixture of 2D and 3D could um, work well and produce the information, the working drawings that everyone wanted. Uh, one of the things which I, I really liked in Reflex, and I tried to do it in Sonata, but it was just too slow, is that passing, we had extra views associated with objects, not just the plan, elevation, section, 3D, but also, and not just data, but we had what I call the physics view, where information was passed backwards and forwards. So the physics view would know about the rate of flow of air across along the pipes, or the ductwork, and what size it needed to be. So it's sort of a combination of maths and um, the standards. And by allowing the air airflow to settle through this, so you just keep passing information backwards and forwards and uh, making sure it had the right deltas weren't too big, then you could actually solve the networks within the, uh, the airflow networks within the duct within the model. My intention was to do the same thing, passing moments and forces around the building, but we didn't quite get to that. And the, the other problem was the machines were just too slow at that time to do such things. Uh, retail was a big part of what we're doing then, and it's still very current. Um, I just, just back to that slide for a moment. The, um, the last use of services was in 2015. I went to see Sonata running live at, at BAM Construct in 2015, and they said they were using it on live projects up to 2010, when there's nothing else. So this is code written in 1984, running in 2015 for services projects. And going on to this, this is the retail. Um, I will be talking a little bit about retail, but I think we're going to run out of time. So Sonata in 95, 1985 had all of the requirements for BIM. I, I don't think anyone really contests that now. Um, 
I went with this to Sonat with to Autodesk in, and you have to guess the date in a moment. And I went to Autodesk and you have to guess which day I was at Autodesk in the morning. I went in there first thing in the morning with a couple of the guys and they'd already seen it, all the technical team had seen it. So I went to Sausalito and we're sitting in there presenting and half an hour into the talk, my presentation, and th this was to, to finally sell the system for a nice sum of money. Halfway into the talk, the phone rang and it was for the CEO. It was, uh, he went, he was okay. He spoke for another 15 minutes, another phone call. Everybody, everybody got up and walked out. And if you look at the top of that little curve there, that's me just waiting. And that very day, the stock price went down heavily and we went home empty handed. So talk about fate. Don't, nothing's in the bag until it's in your bank account. Instead, I sold to a nameless group of people I really don't want to talk about, but I had already fallen out with them, but this was my, I didn't really have a lot of option and I was tired of taking, I ran the technical set and the company. So I was tired of that. I went on, I gave it a year or two off and went on to write reflex. We have seen a couple of Im images from reflex. So I'm sort of cheated a little bit, but C++ based opposed to Fortran, which is much better. And we had the interpretive compiler and executor replaced by cross compiling code into, um, DLLs, dynamic link libraries, which we could execute uh, really fast. And here we have a couple more videos. How are we doing for time, John? The reflex modeling package is central to the process. An object oriented database allows the models to be quickly constructed from a range of powerful elements. Each element in the model represents a physical component within the finished scheme and has a wide range of information assigned to it. Here you see the slider bar representation, at the model. cost, so we have data quantity, program, and maintenance. model becomes a coordinated and comprehensive database of all project information at all stages of the project. This is the project team and can be linked to a wide range of existing software to allow effective and intelligent exchange of planning, cost and specification information. The system has the ability to act as a complete management tool or to resolve a specific issue and is now being utilized on a diverse range of projects throughout the company. Taylor Woodrow are applying the technology to increasingly complex engineering and infrastructure projects where coordination of structure and services are of prime importance. Let's we'll skip that one. We're doing fine for time, Jonathan. This is absolutely fantastic. Keep going. Okay. The Royal Albert Hall, unique among buildings, holds a special place in people's hearts across the world. The nation's village hall has become one of the world's principal music venues. However, there is now a need for additional and improved facilities for performers and public alike. Taylor Woodrow's initial nine-month appointment for this technically demanding contract involves the full integration of models into the system, the programming and sequencing of the work. This is on a silicon graphics. Direct so linking of the model like to planning on. packages has been achieved to test the sequencing of the case associated with the balcony corridor and the main seating areas before resources committed to the project. All areas affected by the works can then be highlighted and a full assessment made in conjunction with all interested parties. In relation to construction work associated with the South Steps area, existing details of the basement construction have been recorded. 
to assist in coordination, as well as to liaise with neighbours to ensure the project progresses with minimum disruption to existing residents and building occupants. Uh, I sold Reflex in 1996 to Parametric Technology. We have several thousand customers globally. I was appointed CTO of Parametric. Parametric was a mechanical engineering. Well, they did uh, washing machines, that sort of thing. I think most of you know Parametric. Um, now this is where the story gets a little more interesting. The founders of Revit were working at PTC as in the on the mechanical side and were not construction people. They acquired the full non-exclusive development rights to Reflex for Reflex. Uh, they had full access to all the sources. I gave them a copy of the sources. I gave them myself. And they had 80 man hours of training from my guys on how the code worked and what it was. Most of the functionality, I think if everyone, anyone's used both the system will realize it's very similar or identical. I have this version running it here on my machine. And I'm just, when I get a bit of time, I will make, there are errors which occurred in Sonata and Reflex and Revit, which are identical. It's just a matter of me spending a little bit of time to actually show how identical. Um, Revit claims to be the first parametric building modeler. Well, I'll leave you to make your introduction on that one. Uh, you see here the, um, this is a reflex store, top left, was defined by the users and you change the parameters and it happens. So you have other parameters like pointers to the wall and things, which uh, has to happen in order to cut the hole where the door is in the wall, as happened in Sonata and Reflex. Then you need, and Revit, you need to have uh, the wall needs, they need to know about each other for closure details, for holes, for um, passing information between each other. Uh, we use that same passing information to pass air pressure and temperature in other objects. You can see the similar parameters, the booleans, I mean 80% or 90% of the functionality is the same. Again, I don't think there's much argument anymore about whether Re Revit was derived from Reflex to suggest that they did all those man years of work and ended up with something totally separately is just rubbish. The, um, yeah, the, let's leave it at that. So, and this is the screenshot from uh, BAM Construct in 2015 using their services. So, from Sonata, we have Reflex, Pro Reflex, Arctic had its influence, and I'll show you a slide that suggests why in a minute. Revit is a derivative, and Destiny, who actually ended up with the rest of the rights, or is also a derivative of Sonata. So we have an open letter from Graphisoft just saying that Sonata was the first system and that um, naturally influenced us as their keywords there. Um, I then went on to do some other technologies and taught at Harvard and did some research at MIT on AI. One of my other projects was that I came up with more recently is someone asked for a batteryless sensor that was permanent. That you could embed in tires or in buildings. So I came up with an RFID chip, well, after a year or two of playing with it, which had a sensor attached to it. So you, you activate the RFID trip, chip and the frequency, variance of the frequency, uh, gives you uh, what the parameter that the sensor is measuring. So in the first, in the case of tires, I have a um, pressure sensor, and here you see different test capabilities in my house at home, and this is actually the installation where it was running it, I'll show you in a moment. But a sensor sitting in the tire without batteries picks up the uh, as, as it's moved over in the tire, the aerial activates the sensor and you get a change, you know which tire it is and you know what the variance in pressure is. Um, we also, I also did the um, 
tread depth with a different sort of technology. I still have the patent in that, and that company is still running. <coughs> Um, on the, into the internet. So another thing, I was swimming with my wife in Thailand, and I was going to add this slide in there, and I saw a piece of bamboo spinning in the waves. So I came back and built this in the back garden. It's uh, six meters, five meters long, 60 kilos, and this is it sitting in the Plymouth wave tank, uh, generating torque. And I have the piece of the flexible drive shaft here, which is destroyed various times. Which could uh, maybe a half inch drive shaft. I did a city information modeling company for a little bit and started to set up this. I should say, until this moment, I've taken no money from anyone. So all the companies at this point were self-funded. The first one was 100, Sonata was 100% mine. The second one was 87% Reflex, was 87% mine. And the uh, my colleague shared the rest of it and these ones. So I was very bad at raising venture money. Um, and I've come to write a book about all of this. The main, re the only reason I wrote a book is that I did feel that uh, various people were claiming things that just weren't true and ignoring the history. So I've, I think this book shows the history of how it gone from PDS, BDS in the 70s, 60s and 70s to Sonata, to Reflex, to Revit and to modern systems. It actually talks about uh, modern systems in the book, um, which I'm not sure we're going to get much of a time to look at now, but um, it is a hundred thousand words. The words didn't come particularly easily, and it, but it is was rewritten various times. It's not so much about my personal story, but more about the different bits of uh, BIM and how it works and how it's connected. So it's, there are various aspects to it. But one of the things I did write just recently is a little app to go with it, which is that's the app running on an iPhone. And excuse how bad this piece of video is. It's just really bad. Um, so pointing the app at the book and it recognizes pages and photographs in the book. This app is actually generally available for people writing books and animation. So you can add animations or models or videos or anything. In fact, so it's a very general piece of code, but it's just to try out the idea more or less of and to allow people to see the videos you're seeing as attached in the book. Um, the current project we're on is retail information modeling. It has a pretty full detail in there about how information modeling is paid to retail. And um, the company is called 345. And I really don't want to say too much about it. Uh, we are not quite in stealth mode, but we're not really talking about our successes, which are numerous and considerable. Um, but we are applying the basic principles with a lot of new technologies. This is what I've spent three of the four years writing. Um, basically the same principles as BIM applied to retail, but also applying artificial intelligence for a range of different things, cloud database for the obvious things, uh, augmented reality, a lot of augmented reality to assist in constructing the store and recording what's there, and so on and so forth. Um, this I will talk about at some stage um, for anyone who's interested in retail, but I don't think it's quite, I don't really want to say too much more at this moment here on this venue. Um, most of those ideas have gone in and the response from the retailers is, is significant. Um, talking about BIM at the moment, the book does talk about the future of BIM and it actually has chapters and chapters and chapters on how information modeling can be applied and it should be applied and how the different technologies affect it. Um, 
Rabbit itself is still, I think that's pretty beginning to be obvious. Open letters, threats, no real change in the technology. Not even, you can see there are similarities in the technology from the 1980s. And the three million lines of code they have is hard to change. And especially, I suspect that no one really got their head around every aspect of it. They seem to have lost some of the stuff that I did originally, but a lot of it's there. But this is, um, I seem to have my slide slightly out of order, but this is the different technologies applied into RIM, into retail information modeling. And these are actual live images from some of our software. So this is dynamic images that you can go through, pick up stuff and look like this in a range of different sorts of programs. Um, apart from changing how, how access to the systems, there is a whole range of technologies which need to be applied to BIM to make it more accessible. You know, we don't want to have 10,000 icons scattered around you have where you have to know where things are. It has to be, I want to be able to sit and use the system it's like driving a car. If it's too much more difficult than driving a car, I don't want to know really. And I don't, I don't manage on anything that's really that complex. Um, if my 12 year old son can't do it, then I'm not really, it, it's not up to it, not up to the job of being usable in my sense. Sure, there are going to be some maths and some things and techniques which are unknown, but you should, you should be able to find your way around. So applying AI, AR, VR can help and mobile computing, there are all those possibilities can help with BIM. I mean, we are, I think about how to build a better system on a daily basis. And having spent four years building RIM, this is um, beginning to be, get to the moment where we can look at it. This is the book and um, I'm not allowed to advertise it. So perhaps I better not say anything, but <laughs> this, uh, it's worth a read. If you want to understand, if you are interested in computer science of it or the database structures or the future or artificial intelligence, how it's used, then this book actually goes rather further than I've gone on the future. A lot of the images have come from uh, from that book. Fantastic! Well, <laughs> I can demonstrate the book here. It's uh, it's really worth a worth a look. Absolutely great, and Jonathan, that's been uh, been spellbinding. Uh, really great. So let's use.